Thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. I will talk about the single cell haystack a method which we developed in the last few years. And I think I should start with the background. And I don't know how much I should explain about this. So please tell me if it's too easy or too <laughs> difficult. But I, so it's about a single cell data analysis. And maybe, you know, we can isolate single cells, many single cells. And after several steps, we can count how many transcripts, how, how many mRNA molecules we find in each cell. And after some processing, basically, it looks like a, this kind of data. So for every cell, we have a row. And for every gene, there's a, a column. And those numbers are the counts, uh, how, how many RNAs did we find for each uh, gene in each cell, I think. And this, this kind, so it could have maybe 10,000 or 50,000 or 1 million rows and could be like 10,000 or 20,000 columns. So it's not so easy for a human to look at this data and find something uh, interesting. So typically what we do is we reduce the dimensions uh, uh, using PCA or TSNI or UMAP and we turn it into a 2D plot like this one. So every spot is one cell, and the similar spot cells are close to each other in this plot. And then we, one thing we want to do is we want to find bags of the differentially expressed genes. So they are genes that are expressed or transcribed at a high level in a subset of the cells and not in the others. So for example, let's say they have a very high expression here, but not in the others. So to find those kind of that, so those are interesting genes, I guess. To find those kind of genes, typically we we cluster the cells using some algorithm. So if each color here might be one of the clusters. And then we will compare between the clusters. So we take this cluster and take the cells of this cluster and run a statistical test for every gene, basically, to see. Is there, a, is there a gene that has a high expression here, but not in the other uh, cluster? And then we do it, the same thing for this cluster, and then for this cluster, and for this cluster, and this cluster, and so on, and so on, and so on. So it gives us the DEGS, hopefully. So there are two steps here, clustering, and then running many comparisons. And I think it's fine, but it's, uh, this, there are some difficulties, I guess. It's, uh, and they are caused uh, I, uh, fundamentally because this data is high dimensional. So it's very hard for us to check if uh, that, that clustering makes sense, for example. So it, it's often unclear how many clusters there are, for example. So if I show you the same plot without the colors and I ask you how many clusters are there, I think everyone will give a different answer, uh, right? And so even if I say, okay, th these are good clusters, I, it's uh, not so clear what the border means between the orange and the green cluster, for example, uh, because we cannot look at the original data so easily. And sh so should this be one big cluster or should this be two clusters or should this be three clusters? No, no one knows, of course. And then also it means I, ha I have to do many comparisons, right? So it takes time and it's not so elegant. And, and finally, the, the DEGs that you can find are restricted by your clusters. You cannot find a DEG that does not fit with the clusters. So it would be nice if there's a way for finding those DEGs uh, without having to rely on that clustering so much. And that's a... That was what we tried to make. So and we call our method single cell haystack. And I want to try to explain the, the concept first, I guess. So instead of comparing between the clusters, we will look at the distributions of cells in some input space. So here I'm showing an example. So th this is one example data set. These are the cells inside some space. And this is 2D, but Please imagine that it, it's not really 2D. It could be like 10 principal components or something. 
And here I'm showing two example genes. So this is a clear deck. It has a high expression here and not here. And this one is not a deck. It's a bit hard to see, but it's expressed somewhere what randomly everywhere. So please imagine, I, I want to guess in that input space, where are the cells? So I want, I want to get a reference distribution, we call it. So inside that space, where are the cells? And here I'm trying to show it using a color. So here there are, there are no cells, so it's a white, a low color intensity. And here there are many cells, so it gets a dark color. So imagine now I know where are the cells inside that space. And then our idea is I will do the same thing for every gene now. And I will try to guess not where are the cells, but where, where is the RNA of this gene in that space, let's say. So this gene is expressed here. Now this should be like very dense. And, and there are cells here, but this gene is not expressed here, so it's empty. And here is the same thing for this gene. So because this one is expressed rather randomly everywhere, it will look like this. And then if we compare this distribution to the reference distribution, this one is completely different from the reference. And this one is very similar to the reference. But this is a deck. This is the gene that we want to find. So it has a different then, uh, distribution of RNA from the reference. That's a deck. So, and it does not rely on the clustering or comparing between clusters. It's looking at the distribution. So I have to estimate that distribution. Uh, I don't know how to do it in, in practice. Uh, it's not so, not so trivial, I guess. So what, how do we do this step? Uh, well, I'm skipping many details, but please imagine that we generate many grid points within that space. And then I'm going to calculate the distance between each cell and each grid point. And I'm going to scan, in a sense, through this space and check how, by looking at the distances to the grid points, how many cells are there around each grid point. So this grid point, for example, it, it would get a high density because there are many cells close to it. And this one would get a very low density because there are very few cells close to it. So by looking at the local density around the grid points, I'm estimating that reference distribution. And then for every gene, I will do something very similar. I try to, I, I'm using the same grid point, but now I'm not just looking at the distance, I'm also looking at the expression level. So the distances are weighted by the expression level in every cell. So in this case, again, it has a high expression here. These would be high values. And here there are many cells, but they don't express this gene. So it would be a low value. Okay, so for every gene, I would get a distribution like this one. Then I want to compare that reference distribution to the distribution of every gene. And in practice, we use a Kullback Leiber divergence. So it's, um, it's often used to measure the difference between distributions. So essentially, I'm just running through the grid points here and here, look at the difference of the, of the values, and then calculate this. Uh, divergence. So as an example, this would be my clear DAG. This one has a clear different, uh, clearly different distribution from the reference. So it would get a high kullback leiber divergence. And this one is not a DAG. This distribution is very similar to the reference. So it would get a low kullback leiber divergence. And then we do some randomization. So we shuffle the data. And recalculate everything, shuffle again, recalculate. And we try to estimate a p-value for each kullback leiber divergence. So this one would get a, a very low p-value. So it's statistically higher than you would expect by chance. And this one would get a, a high p-value. This is, this is not interesting to us. So this, this is the gene that we want to find. And that's basically how the method works. So I think it's not so difficult in the end. So I want to show some applications. So this is on a single cell RNA sync data set. It has 5,000 cells. It's the one that I showed at the beginning. So here we give us input. 
that 10 D space. So each cell has a 10 coordinates in that space. So we give the space and the gene expression data. And it finds the grid points, calculates the Goldbach fiber divergences, does some randomizations. And so these would be some of the high scoring genes. So they all have a high expression in a subset of the cells and not in the others. Uh, so it's working, I guess. And then later we realized there are many other uh, applications that we can do. So it's not limited to single cell data. So now one is a spatial transcriptomics. I don't know how much I should explain about spatial transcriptomics. So basically, you imagine you take a, a tissue and you cut a very thin slice. Uh, and then within that slice, we can measure where is each gene expressed. Uh, so the gene expression with a location in the tissue. So this is an example for a mouse liver tissue. Uh, uh, so for, for more than 10,000 genes, we can see for every gene within that tissue, where, where is the expression high or low? And many of the genes look like this, so like random noise, I guess. But some of them so look like this one. And so this is albumin. Uh, it has a very peculiar pattern, I guess. So it's, it's high and then low and high and low and high and low. So it reflects the structure of the liver tissue, something called liver zonation. So we want to find this kind of a gene within those 10,000 of, 10, of genes. There, some of them look like this. So that's what we want to find now. So in this case, we don't give the 10 principal components as input space. So we just give the, the real 2D space of this tissue, so X and Y, uh, as, as input. But everything is the same flow. So it, our method will make those grid points, look at the distributions, and find the genes that have a surprising distribution. And so these are some examples. So this is, also, this is the same 10x genomics physium platform. So this is a, a high scoring gene in the human liver tissue. So you can see that very peculiar pattern again. And this is a high scoring gene in a mouse kidney or in a mouse brain, uh, so uh, anterior parts or posterior parts. So we can see these very complex patterns, I guess. And this is another platform and another platform. So uh, the high scoring genes, they tend to have a clear pattern. So it works, I guess. And then, uh, okay, spatial analysis, uh, pathway analysis. So this method is not limited to integers. So I could also say, okay, I will, for all the biological pathways, I will take the genes that are known to play a role in that pathway, and I will take the average of their expression. So I will try to estimate the activity of each pathway. And I can, I can give that activity to single cell haystack. So they should not be integers, for example. And then still it can predict which pathways are, are surprising, let's say. So these pathways, they are active in different parts of the kidney, for example. And then our last one is trajectory analysis. So our, our method can accept that like 10D input or 50D input or 2D input, but also 1D input. So uh, for example, what people often do is they, they want to predict a, traject a trajectory, so like differentiation, uh, uh, what, yeah, trajectory in, a, in some single cell data set. So this is one example in timers. So there's a, these are a double negative T cells and then double positive T cells and then mature T cells. So some methods can predict this trajectory. And then for every cell, we can get a, its position along this 1D path, let's say. We call it pseudo time. So, and this is like a 1D space now. So I can give that 1D space, that trajectory as input to our method. And then again, it will do the same thing. So it looks at the density within that 1D space now, cal calculates the Kullback fibers divergences, uh, and so on. And these would be some of the high scoring genes in that case. So they all change over time. Uh, so it looks reasonable, I guess. 
okay, and now <laughs> that was the bioinformatics part. And now uh, I have to talk about the package implementation in R. But I think the most important point is here. Uh, this was the first time that I made a package. It's also so far the only time that I made a package. Uh, I am a complete beginner. Uh, I did this together with Dr. Diego Diaz, who's much more experienced uh, with these things. Uh, my impression was this was not difficult, but it was complicated to me. Uh, I. I don't know which thing to do when. <laughs> or I'm not so sure always which one does what. Uh, but if looking at this uh, reference, for example, or talking with him, of course, I, I could do it. Uh, OK. <laughs> and I think this will be way too simple for you. But what I remember is I can use this, use this package. And then just call a function, create package, and give the name of your package. And it will set up a like an empty template. And it makes this description file, where, uh, which is also a template. You can just fill in what, what's the name of your package, what does it do, who are you, and so on. And then it prepares this R directory, which you already <laughs> showed previously. So even uh, AI can do this. <laughs> but also a beginner can do this, apparently. And then in that R directory, you put your R scripts, right? And then uh, you have to... Before, I saw the documentation in Sirana. I, was, I always imagined those people wrote that documentation by hand. I thought this would be a lot of work. And now I realize, actually, this is not so difficult. So if you use this R oxygen, to a package, you just put your cursor here, and then you click here, insert that R oxygen skeleton, and it, again, it makes a template uh, with the title of your function and what are the inputs, what are the outputs, and then you can just fill them in. I, guess. I think you know about this better than I do, probably. And then at the end, you you can run this, uh, yeah this function, and it will gather everything and process it for you, more or less, uh, as far as I remember. And while I made this package, I also started to better understand what I want a package to do or to be. And the first point here is, I, of course, I want it to be accurate. Although here, it's difficult to judge if it really works, because we actually, we don't know the correct answer for the predicting those DAGs. But another thing is I want it to be relatively fast. Uh, some of these DAG prediction programs, they are very slow, actually, to the point that I think you cannot use them. Uh, it, it, you, you will get too irritated, I feel. So it means we had to measure time. And before, I used to use these very basic approaches. Maybe you know, like sys.time. It, it gives you the current time, and then you run haystack, for example, and you again get the current time. And then you look at the difference, and it will say, OK, it, it took 40 seconds or something. Like that. And this is the same thing, uh, more or less. It will also tell you this took 14 seconds. But this is not enough. If, you want, if I want to make this package fast, Okay, so this is not a good example because it's just 14 seconds. But normally, this, it, at the beginning, this could be one hour. But this is not enough. I want to know which part took time, or which part should I improve, in other words. Uh, I remember I used this rprof function. So I guess it's rprofiler. Or something. You call rprof, then you run whatever command you want to test, I guess. And you can output a summary. Uh, and it prints out a, a, maybe several tables, actually. And so what's in the table? So it shows the, the function, all the functions that were used. And this shows the time. Uh, it's a bit hard to understand. So self-time means how many seconds were spent inside this function. And total time means, so this is excluding functions that were called from this function. 
And total time means how much time was spent in this function, including other functions that were called from this. So it shows me that, that maybe of those 14 seconds or so, five and a half were spent inside the call sounds. And including the calls from call sounds, it's eight seconds. And this is almost 60% of the time. On the other hand, so, so call sums, it calculates the sums of columns, right? So we need it for uh, calculating the distances between the grid points and the cells. And we need it for calculating the Kullback library divergence, maybe. So of course, it takes a lot of the runtime. And sample, so we use sample for doing the shuffling. Now this one takes only 1.7% of the runtime. So if I want to improve the runtime of my method, I should not try to rewrite sample. Right? I should try to rewrite call sums, which I did not do because I think call sums is already very well written. I cannot improve it further, probably. But at the beginning, probably the, these functions were other functions, which we improved step by step. And the, I noticed later, there's also something called I guess profiler visualization. So if you install this one uh, in our studio, you can click profile and start profiling. Then run the commands that you want and do stop profiling. And then it will show something similar, I guess, more, more in, a, in a visual way. And so this, this is just a screenshot, but it would be interactive. So if you hover your cursor above it, it will show you all the parts that were the same function. So here too, I can see that, a lot of the time, so this is time in milliseconds from the beginning to the end. I can see that a lot of time is spent in that call sums function. So if I want to improve it, I should focus on call sum. Yes. Now, of course, I also want the, it to be easy to use. So it should be well documented. Of course, I can use our oxygen to, to do that. And also, I want to add examples online. I think you know you can make your examples and then push them to GitHub, and it will appear like a, a website on GitHub. And also, I want it to be easy to install. OK. Uh, what do I mean by this? Um, I, I think you know this concept, maybe. <laughs> so there's a Surat package. Right? It's often used for single cell data analysis. And I like it very much. But if I have to install Surat on my server, I feel fear, let's say. I might go to the campus in the morning thinking, I will do a lot today. And I will go home in the evening thinking, today all I did was installing Surat. So it has 50, more than 50 dependencies. And of course, each of them also has dependencies. Uh, it makes sense because Surat does many things, of course. But the problem is, for, for me, so it, it includes, for example, GG ridges for making rich plots. Uh, I like rich plots, but I think I have never made a rich plot in Surat. And also, it has ROCR. In, it's for making ROC curves or precision recall curves. And I like ROC curves <laughs> and precision recall curves, but I have never made an ROC curve in Surat. So is it really necessary to force the users to install all these packages if they want to install Surat? Uh, if you fail to install one of these, you will be stuck. Right? It will take a lot of time maybe to solve it. So I think it's not necessary to force it. So in our our strategy with single cell haystack was to try to keep this to a minimum. I think we only have five dependencies. Of course, our method does only one thing, and Surat does many things, but still. And we try to let the user decide if they want to install a dependency, yes or no. So for example, uh, there, this data, so it's a table, right? Uh, it's cells versus genes. But for some platforms, so this table is, is huge, and 99.5% of the values are zero, uh, without exaggerating, especially for this one. So 
that data is not so stored in a normal matrix in R. It's stored in a sparse matrix. It only stores the non-zero values. But non-zero, those sparse matrices, they are hard to work with in the base R. So some people made packages specifically for those sparse matrices. And one of, one of them is sparse matrix stars. But so I think depending on the user, they will never use this kind of data and they will not install sparse matrix stats. So should I force them to install this package? I think no. So within Haystack, we check, uh, does the, has the user installed this package? If yes, we will, we will say, okay, yes, we will use it. If no, we will say, maybe you want to install this, but we, we will not use it. So we will say, use, use this spatial, uh, use this sparse matrix that is false. And then later, so we have to calculate the standard deviations of each row in this table. Then we check, <laughs> is that package available? If yes, we use it. If no, we use just the base R. So I'm, for the typical user, this base R will be good enough. Like, they will not notice the difference. Right? But if they want to use this kind of data, they will notice the difference. Yeah. So as a conclusion, uh, we made a method for finding DAGs in single cell and spatial data. Uh, so it's re relatively generally applicable. So it shouldn't it doesn't have to be single cell data. It shouldn't, it doesn't have to be spatial data. It could also be like single cell attack sig data or site sig data or gene sets. And the input could be, so originally we imagined it's high dimensional you know, PCs, you know, principal components, but it could also be 2D space you know, in, within the tissues, for example, or it could be a 1D trajectory. It does not rely on comparing between clusters and as a result of that, in principle, it can find any pattern, I think. I didn't show it, but I think it's relatively fast. I didn't, I didn't show it, but I think it's relatively accurate. And it's available as an R package. And then lately, uh, my collaborator, uh, Diego Diaz, he's also developing a Python version mm -hmm. that can be run on huge data sets um, of like, several millions of cells. So I should really thank uh, him. And uh, also there's some funding that I'm receiving. And if someone is interested in this kind of work, uh, please contact me anytime. Uh, and also I should say, I'm now developing a, a spatial transcriptomics database called DeepSpaceDB. Uh, this is the URL. Uh, and so a part of it is, looking at those spatially variable genes. So we are using that single cell haystack to pre-calculate those results. And so if you go to that website, you can, so here I'm running through some of them. So you can see in the mouse brain, for example, some of the high scoring genes, and they are clearly expressed in different parts of the brain. That's all, thank you very much. I should say, unfortunately, I was not so involved with the Python one, but I, as far as I know, he's trying to really get them to return identical results, or more or less. It's hard to do because it there's a random component in the shuffling, but they return very similar results. I think in theory, they are the same. The, the content should be the same. But Python is a lot faster. <laughs> and unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know. Yeah. So with the R code, when you're trying to make it faster, did you use like C++ at all? So you think the speed differences are inherent to R and Python? I think so, yes. No, I'm, I'm not confident enough to, to try to convert it into C++, unfortunately. I can show an example of the... 
Python one. Uh, it, this is uh, although this is already a bit old, uh, an older result. I, this might be faster now. So this is a ah, this is a um, ah, yeah. This is four point three million cells. And here we gave the first 50 PCs. So it's a 50 dimensional space. Uh, uh, might be too much, I feel. And this took about um, more than two hours to finish, actually. Uh, this, this is what that data set looks like. These are the top scoring genes. Although I feel at this point, basically every gene is probably differentially expressed in some way. Uh, wow. Well. So it's, but if you would do this in R, I think you will suffer <laughs> uh, with memory and runtime. So, no. But on the smaller data sets, they should return more or less the same. Uh, uh, this Python package is something nice. So I'm going to register this package on IPI. Special uh, uh, I'm not so familiar with the Python <laughs> thing. <laughs> Put it somewhere. That's all I can say, I'm afraid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I uh, should know. Can I ask the video of the algorithm? Uh, uh, um, what should I say? So, or maybe I can, sh I can, sh but uh, I don't know how, if I can show the algorithm. Um, well, maybe okay. I can go through this maybe and explain a little bit. So, in in a sense, the so th this is the same data set that I showed in the slide. So let's use that one as an example, for example. And the, so the input you give is really so the in this case the PCA space, maybe ten PCs, and the and the okay, so for the top the ten is component. Mm -hmm. Well, for, of course, I don't know what's a suitable number. It depends on the data set, I think. Yeah, uh, I could understand this cellular distribution is calculated by Gaussian kernel, but mm. uh, uh, how about the expression distribution, the gene expression uh, distribution? Okay, okay. So, There too. So for, for calculating the reference, so I calculate the distance between each cell and each grid point. Mm -hmm. And then some well, turn that into a normal kernel. Uh, mm -hmm. So if a cell is close to a grid point, it will give a high contribution. If it's far away, it will give a very low contribution to that grid point. Oh. Uh, I, well, maybe the slides are better. <laughs> I, I, let me go here. So I, I run through each cell and each grid point. I calculate the distance. And if a cell is close to this grid point, it will contribute a lot to its density. So these cells that are around here, they will give high contributions to this grid point and lower contributions to these grid points. And I sum all the contributions for all the grid points. That's what gives me these numbers, uh, the, these values. So there's, there are very few cells around here, and the sum of all the contributions for this one would be low, and they would be high for, for this one, for example. And then for the expression, so I look at the, the distance between the cell and the grid point, but I multiply it with the expression of this gene in this cell, in each cell. So these cells around here for this gene, uh, they will contribute a lot to those grid points because they are close and because they express this gene. Um, I'm adding the distance and the, and the expression now. 
And here, uh, these cells, they contribute to these grid points, but the expression is, is zero. So it will be weighted by zero. Will, they will not contribute anything to these grid points. That's why these grid points have a low value and these have a high value. But so in the end, it's just multiplying matrices and summing. That's why the call sums function takes a lot of the runtime. Yeah, on, on the, on the uh, so you use the each expression level as weight. Yeah, as a weight. Oh. Mm. And then calculate this, this called back library divergence just by running through the grid points here and here, looking at the difference in the values and, and uh, taking the logarithm multiplying. And again, summing. So yeah, it's in a sense not so complex, I think. And then the question becomes: yeah, Is this a high value or not? So we discovered that. So if if a gene is ex is expressed only in one cell, for example, and that cell is here, uh, this grid point would have a very high value, and all the other grid points would have a very low value that would be completely different from the reference. So that would give a very high Kullback library divergence, but it's, it's just a noise. This gene is expressed in only one cell. So this gets a high Kullback library divergence, but the significance should be very low. Now that's why we do the randomization. So if you randomize such a gene, it will always get a high Kullback library divergence. Uh, so we use that to to add a, like a statistical test to uh, and see if it's, if this is really high, yes or no. So if it's statistically high, so. no, I don't know if it makes sense. But uh, I think uh, calculation of Kullback divergence uh, is very uh, difficult because it's based on best data, mm -hmm. so. You have to discretize the distribution first. Mm. Uh, but uh, we don't know how to estimate the uh, number of width size. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's hard to figure out what uh, the how to how uh, did you calibrate this measure? Uh, so uh, maybe I'm confused by 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 the question. So but. Well, once once you have the grid points, uh, I'm running through all the grid points here. Uh, so from the from the first one to the last one, and uh, for every gene, I'm I'm checking what's what's the value here and here and here and here and here. And this Q, so it's my reference. So once you have the grid points, and once you have their density, this is just, this is a simple calculation. Okay, so each is small j is each grid point. Here's each grid point. Yeah, so and we pick like 100 grid points by default. I, if your database is, if your data set is very large, you can increase the number of grid points. If it's very small, you can decrease the number of grid points. So it's one parameter, I'm afraid. Uh, how to pick the suitable number of grid points is, a, is another question. So I have one question. So I I'm so interested in the uh, pathway analysis to map the two D uh, view. Uh -huh. So how, how do you, how do you so integrate the uh, to this uh, uh, single cell data with with uh, uh -huh. pathway pathway data? So yeah, I think so. Pathway data is so small, right? Uh -huh. Compared to the single cell data, so. Actually, it, uh, this is, what we did here is not so complex, actually. Uh, please imagine you, you get the gene ontology yeah. data uh, ah, for every biological process. You check which genes are in, involved with that process. Mm -hmm. And then just uh, calculate something ah. like the average of expression of those oh. genes. But the, so the point that the point here is some of those deck prediction methods, they assume that the input should be integer, for example. And their statistical test depends on integers. That's, that's not necessary here. 
And th this input could be almost anything. Right? Oh. So this could be the average. Right? Oh, just uh, just using the ontology, mm -hmm. the, you extract the, some genes from uh -huh. the uh, uh, matrix. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I I don't know how. If, well, I, don't know. I could show an example. <laughs> yeah, so. Maybe I'm already.